Okay guys, in this video we are going to talk about some of the mathematical um, details of thermodynamics, specifically about state functions and um, some of the consequences of the fact that state functions are uh, can be described as an exact differential. Um, these, uh, these mathematical properties of state functions uh, lead to all sorts of different relationships and there's all sorts of quantities that you can define and also measure and so we're going to explore some of those uh, in the next set of slides. Uh, recall that uh, state functions are represented by exact differentials such as this example here involving the internal energy the du is an exact differential and to calculate a change in the state function, you simply need to know the final value of the state function minus the initial value. Uh, whether or not this is a practical calculation or not, you know, uh, that depends on which state function you're talking about, but in principle at least, uh, you can calculate the change in the state function by a simple difference. Contrast that with a path function like heat, uh, which is represented by an inexact differential uh, you need to know the specific path between the initial state and the final state in order to calculate the, the actual heat of that path, and it will depend upon how you get from the initial state to the final state. Um, however, for the, for the, exact, or for the state function, uh, the change in the state function is completely independent of the path. You can take any path you want between the initial state and the final state, and the change in the state function will always be the same. Uh, I've got that illustrated here on this slide. We're looking at the internal energy as a function of the volume and temperature of the system. And we have some initial state here with this energy, and then a final state here with that energy. And we're looking at two different paths in going from the initial state to the final state. Here's one in this uh, green color and another one in this uh, red color. Uh, I believe the uh, path 1 corresponds to um, an adiabatic path. So this path here, this is an adiabatic path where there's no heat exchanged during this process. So in that process the heat is zero and you know because you're expanding the system so it looks like you're going from a smaller volume to a larger volume uh, there's some work that's being done in that process. Uh, if you take this other path here, which is a non-adiabatic path, meaning that there is heat exchanged during this pathway, what you see is that, of course, then the heat won't be zero, and the work is going to be somewhat different than it is in path one. And that's because no matter which path you take, the change in the internal energy is always the same. However, the value of the path functions vary depending upon which path you take. Uh, you'll note in that last um, slide I, I represented the internal energy as a function of temperature and volume. For a uh, closed system with constant composition, uh, you can really choose any two variables that you want. So temperature and volume are, are perfectly valid but you could also use temperature and pressure or pressure and volume if you wanted. And you typically want to choose as your independent variables the most convenient variables for you to use and that will usually be one that is where, where one of them is held constant. So for example if you're doing an isothermal experiment it would be very convenient to choose temperature and volume as your variables because you've already got one of them held constant. Likewise if you were doing a uh, isobaric experiment. It may be convenient to think in terms of temperature and pressure as your independent variables because the pressure is already held constant so now you only have to worry about temperature. Anyway that's the idea behind this choose wisely uh, warning. Well here we have a, uh, a problem. It's just we've looked at these problems already uh, but it's useful to go over them a couple of times. Um, 
here this is just meant to illustrate the difference between state functions and path functions. So here we're, we're considering the um, expansion of a gas at constant temperature. It's a perfect gas, so the ideal gas law holds. Uh, and we're being asked to look at a free gas, a free expansion against zero external pressure and compare that to a reversible isothermal gas expansion. So we want to calculate Q, W, delta U, and delta H. Well, if it's a perfect gas, we've already learned that both the internal energy and the enthalpy depend only upon temperature for a perfect gas. So in this case, for both paths, since temperature is not changing, we're going to have delta U equals delta H equals zero for perfect gas under isothermal conditions. And because delta U and delta H are state functions, this applies to both paths. Uh, for path one, the free expansion, since the external pressure equals zero, then the work, which is equal to this integral, this is also going to be equal to zero. Right? If there's no external pressure, then the work is equal to zero. And then to calculate the heat, you know, heat would be delta U minus the work. Well, both of those are zero. So the heat, the heat for path one is also zero. Uh, for path two, we've got a reversible isothermal uh, expansion of an ideal gas. And we've learned previously that this is the correct formula to use for a reversible isothermal expansion of an ideal gas, so that's the work. And then the heat, delta U minus the work, delta U is zero, and so the heat is just minus the work. So it would be plus nRT natural log of Vf over Vi. Okay. So our our state functions, they're independent of path. Our path functions, their values depend upon what path you've taken. So next we're going to jump into um, some more mathematics. Um, and specifically, we're going to be looking at our um, at our state functions as multivariable functions. So, so for example, the internal energy. We can choose temperature and volume to be uh, independent variables. Uh, the pressure would then depend upon temperature and volume as well through the um, equation of state. And so, what we're what we're asking ourselves in is if I make changes in temperature and volume. How do those changes affect the internal energy? And in multivariable calculus, we use what is called a total differential. Okay, and so that's this du. This is the total differential, or the internal energy. So a change in the internal energy can be brought about by changing the temperature and or by changing the volume. Okay. And so that's what it means for these to be independent variables. So these are the independent variables. The internal energy is the dependent variable. You change temperature, that's going to change you. You can change volume, that's going to change you. How do we express that change in the internal energy mathematically? We use this expression here. Okay. And there's a pattern that I want you to notice. Okay. So it's the total differential of the dependent variable. And you see here you've got the differentials of the independent variables. And they are being multiplied by a slope. Okay, this derivative, this partial derivative, which tells us the change in the internal energy with respect to a change in temperature at constant volume. So if you keep the volume constant, how does the internal energy change when you change the temperature? 
On this one, it's the opposite. How does the internal energy change when you change volume at constant temperature? And I have a, um, a figure from the textbook which is meant to illustrate that. So we have our internal energy along this z-axis, and then along the x and the y-axis we have our, our, our temperature and our volume. And so these, these partial derivatives, as they're called, uh, they represent, let's take the first one, what's the change in U as we change volume, keeping temperature constant? So take a look at our, our axes down here. If you're keeping temperature constant and you're changing volume, that means you're moving in this direction. You're moving along the volume axis, but you're not letting your, your position along temperature change. Right? So you're moving this direction perpendicular to the temperature axis. And you're asking yourself, how does the internal energy change as I make this change along volume? Well, in this diagram, you see that the energy starts out here and it drops down. Okay, so this, the slope of that curve would be negative. As you increase the volume, the energy drops. And so this would be a negative slope in this case. Well, let's keep, uh, this time let's keep the volume constant, but then change the temperature. And so that would be like moving, um, moving along this direction, so parallel to the temperature axis, but perpendicular to the volume axis, keeping the volume constant. And so as you go from here to there, keeping the volume constant, you see that the internal energy increases in that direction. So this would be a positive slope. Now, any arbitrary change in the, inner, in the internal energy may involve a change of both temperature and volume. And so you can think of this combining the temperature change and combining the volume change as a little vector in this two-dimensional space of temperature and volume. And we ask ourselves, OK, so what if we walk along this vector here? What would be the change in the internal energy? Well, it involves two components. You would add the change with respect to volume plus the change with respect to temperature. Both would contribute along that direction. And so that would take you from here to here. So the, the part of the, of the change coming from the volume would tend to make the, the internal energy smaller. And then the part of the change with respect to temperature would make the internal energy a little bit bigger. So you have to take into account both both changes when you calculate the total change in U. These partial derivatives are often given their own symbol. It really just depends upon what, what particular partial derivative you're talking about. In the case of how the internal energy changes with respect to temperature, we call it the isochoric heat capacity, which we've encountered previously, Cv which has this definition here. So this is the formal definition of the isochoric heat capacity. Uh, how the internal energy changes with respect to volume at constant temperature is given the symbol pi t. Pi t is called the uh, internal pressure. And it turns out that it represents the, the interactions between, uh, you can think of it in terms of interactions between the gas molecules in the sense that if you uh, were to uh, make the volume larger, okay, so you're pulling gas molecules apart, if the, if the internal energy were to, um, were to increase, then that would mean that you have, um, uh, that, that would give rise to a positive uh, internal pressure, right? If you make the volume larger and you find that the internal energy goes up, that would, that would correspond to a positive internal pressure. That means that you have attractive interactions that are dominating in the, um, in the system, right? Because this, if you have molecules that are attracted to one another and you try to pull them apart from one another, that's going to cause the energy of the system to go up. However, <clears throat> if you uh, find that uh, the internal energy decreases as you make the volume bigger. That would give rise to a negative internal pressure. 
that would mean under those conditions, repulsive interactions are dominating. Dominating. So if you've got molecules that don't want to be next to one another, and then you pull them apart, and you find it stabilizes or lowers the energy, that means you've relieved some of those uh, repulsive interactions. So the sign of the internal pressure uh, suggests something about the uh, attractive or repulsive interactions in the system. And I think I have a figure on that. Here, this, this one shows uh, how we think about the internal pressure. It's the slope of the internal energy as you move along the volume axis at constant temperature. And then here is the interpretation. Uh, for a perfect gas, the internal energy does not depend upon volume. Okay, and So that gives us this baseline here. So there's neither attractive interactions nor repulsive interactions. Um, if you are in a situation where you measure the slope of the internal energy curve with respect to volume and you find that it's negative. That means that you've got repulsive interactions dominating in your system. On the other hand, if you find that the, uh, that the, that the slope of the internal energy versus, um, versus volume curve is positive, that means you've got attractive interactions dominating in the system. The internal pressure, in principle, can be measured if you could if you could monitor the change in energy as you make a volume change, and that was something that that Joule set out to show using an apparatus that looked like this. He has some high pressure gas here and a vacuum here. It's all embedded in a water bath, and the idea is if you open the valve and let the gas expand into a larger volume, uh, you should note some temperature change in the bath corresponding to uh, the energy that is absorbed or released when the gas changes its volume. However, uh, Joule found using this, ap this particular apparatus, uh, he found no change in the temperature or no significant change in the temperature, meaning he couldn't distinguish it from uh, baseline fluctuations uh, because the effect the effect of the internal pressure here is is too small for most gases under ordinary conditions and so uh, this Joule experiment failed in the sense that he wasn't able to show any interactions between the gas molecules uh, later on in this talk we'll look at um, we'll look at a different experiment the Joule Thompson experiment uh, which improved upon uh, the technology that can be used to show uh, to show the the effect. Well, let's uh, let's move on to the next uh, the next part here. Um, in this uh, top in this top uh, equation, what I'm showing is is that you can go from this differential expression. You can integrate both sides. So you can integrate this side, and then you can integrate these terms as well. Okay, so this would take you from the initial state to the final state. So you're going to get a delta u. And then you can integrate from the initial temperature to the final temperature, that term, and the initial volume to the final volume for that term. Okay. For the case of an ideal gas, the internal pressure is zero, and it would reduce to this expression, which we've actually worked with previously. Uh, you can also do things like rearrange the differential expressions. So starting with what we had before, the volume, one trick that I can do I can take the dt and I can move it to both sides. And so I'll keep the pressure constant when I do this. So I'll make, I'll have a partial of u with respect to temperature, keeping pressure fixed. So I brought the t down here and then I'm going to have to bring it over here as well. That leaves my cv alone. I still got the internal pressure, but now I'm going to have the partial of volume 
with respect to temperature at constant pressure. So you can do all sorts of manipulations. And then what we're going to find on the next slide is that that this, which is called the uh, volumetric expansion coefficient, I believe, thermal expansion coefficient, um, this is related to what I'm going to do here is I'm going to multiply and divide by volume. This quantity has its own name and its own symbol. and it can be measured. And it's given by alpha. So we'll look at that next. But I, I just wanted to show you that you could do all sorts of manipulations with these differential expressions. And you can define useful quantities like this thermal expansion coefficient alpha, which measures the change in volume with respect to temperature at constant pressure. See how it's the change in the volume with respect to a change in temperature at constant pressure divided by the volume. Another interesting quantity is the isothermal compressibility factor, KT here. It measures the change in volume with respect to a change in pressure at constant temperature weighted by the volume and multiplied by a negative sign to make sure that it's always positive, right? Because if you squeeze something, if you increase the pressure that usually makes the volume smaller in almost all cases. And so if we want to have a positive quantity, we'll multiply by a negative sign to make it, to make this number positive. I like to think of these as little experiments. You know, we've got two knobs here, temperature and pressure. We're going to leave the pressure knob alone. We're going to change the temperature and we're going to measure the effect on the volume. Here, the knobs that we're turning are the pressure and the temperature. We'll keep temperature fixed. We'll dial in a, a volume and we'll, we'll measure the effect. We'll dial in a pressure and then we'll, we'll measure the effect on the volume. Uh, in the equations to the right, this is one kind of application of them that's, that's I think most useful for solids and liquids, which tend to have essentially constant uh, a constant alpha and kt, that is alpha and kt, kappa t, they don't vary very, they don't change very much with respect to temperature and pressure. Uh, let me illustrate for the case of alpha. Um, what I'll do is I'll take the definition of alpha, sorry, that should be 1 over volume. And what I'll do is I'll put the temperature over here, alpha t equals alpha dt, sorry, over v. And then what I can do is integrate both sides. I'll integrate this side from ti to tf, and this side from vi to vf. I'll assume that alpha is a constant, so that's going to give me alpha times tf minus ti. This side is going to give me natural log of Vf over Vi. And then I'm going to solve for Vf. That's going to give me Vf equals Vi, the exponent of alpha times this temperature difference. And if the argument of the exponential is small, I can use a, a Taylor series expansion and write it as 1 plus that and what I'll do then is I'll just ignore all of the other terms. And so that's where this result on the right comes from. Uh, how would you use this in practice? Well, if you know alpha and you know the volume of your sample, you can predict what the new volume would be when you change the temperature. So that's one of the useful things about the thermal expansion coefficient. At least in, in terms of material science, it's a very useful property. You know, if you're trying to figure out, okay, I've got this component in my spaceship and it's going to be exposed to these temperatures, you know, how much is the size of that component going to change? Is it still going to fit in its housing or is it going to blow up on me? Something like that, you know. Um, and you can do similar things with, um, with the isothermal compressibility. Here we're dealing with the expansion with respect to changes in pressure. 
or compression, you know, this would this would actually make the volume smaller if you made the pressure larger. In any case, so there's all sorts of useful quantities that you can derive in um, in thermodynamics. Uh, here's just a table listing a couple of values for different substances. You see that they're, you know, it's on alpha is on the order of 10 to the minus fourth reciprocal Kelvin, kappa is on the order of 10 to the minus six reciprocal bars. And, and, and here are, the, are a few values for a few substances, and if you want to look up more values, you can go to the resource section of the textbook. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, you can often take alpha and kappa to be constants for solids and liquids, but for gases that is certainly not the case. Uh, here we're being asked to derive expressions for alpha and kappa for an ideal gas. So uh, the ideal gas equation of state is like this. We're going to be working with the volumes, so we'll express it in terms of volume. And then alpha is 1 over volume times the partial derivative of volume with respect to temperature, keeping pressure fixed. So here we're going to practice calculating partial derivatives. So how, how do these partial derivatives work? Well, volume, we're thinking of it as a function of temperature and pressure. And in this expression, we are supposed to treat pressure as if it were a constant. So the n, number of moles, gas constant, and p, as far as this derivative is concerned, are all constant. We're simply taking the derivative with respect to t. And this is an easy derivative to take. So we're going to get, I'll write it here first, 1 over volume. The derivative of this expression with respect to temperature, keeping pressure fixed, is just simply nR over P. Right? And if you look at that, we've got nR over pressure times volume. What are we missing? Well, nR pressure times volume is nRT, those cancel, and so we get that alpha is 1 over T for a perfect gas. We can do the same thing for kappa T, it's a different definition, so now we're looking at the volume as a function of pressure keeping temperature, darn it help if I showed the work. Okay, going back to alpha. Here's our ideal gas law. Solving for volume. This is the definition of alpha. 1 over V, partial of V with respect to T at constant pressure. I'm taking the derivative with respect to volume at constant temperature. Sorry, the derivative of volume with respect to temperature at constant pressure. So this is our variable. We're keeping pressure fixed. It's linear in T. All these are constants as far as this expression is concerned, and so the derivative of this expression with respect to t is just going to be nr over p. So we have nr in the numerator, pressure times volume in the denominator, which equals nrt. Substitute that in, the nr cancels, and we get 1 over the temperature. Now, for kappa, its volume changes with respect to pressure changes, keeping temperature constant. So this time, we're going to assume that the temperature is constant, and we're going to let the pressure be our variable. So the nRT is a constant, and it comes outside. And now we're just left with the derivative of 1 over pressure with respect to pressure. And that's going to be minus 1 over P squared. So here we've got plus nRT over Vp squared. We can substitute pressure times volume in for nRT. The volumes are going to cancel. That pressure is going to cancel one of the pressures there. And we're left with 1 over the pressure. So kappa for the perfect gas is 1 over the pressure. Obviously, these aren't constant. Al alpha is not constant with respect to temperature for a gas.
kappa is not constant with respect to pressure for a gas. Okay, so so you can't you can't, for example, use these two expressions for a gas. They would not work. Well, so we've, we've, we've played around with some partial derivatives, and here I just wanted to illustrate a couple of other examples. Um, in this example, we're looking at pressure and thinking of it as a function of temperature and volume. And so watch the pattern. A change in pressure depends upon a change in temperature and a change in volume. Right? So our dependent variable changes as temperature changes and as volume changes. And the terms out in front, these are our partial derivatives. Notice the pattern. How does pressure change with respect to temperature? Notice it's paired up with the dt while volume is held constant. For the other term, how does the dependent variable pressure change with respect to volume? Notice it's paired up right here as temperature changes. Now I won't go into these expressions here. Uh, you can look you can look for those in your in your textbook. Who knows? It may be even one of the example problems. Uh, but you can use all sorts of tricks from calculus to express one partial derivative in terms of other partial derivatives, uh, which are fun exercises uh, when you're learning uh, multivariable calculus. But it it would be a pretty boring video, I think. So just note that. You can play all sorts of little games where you express one derivative in terms of others. And that can be very useful, right? If you know these quantities, but you don't want to do this experiment, then you would just use the known values to calculate that. Uh, here's a, an application of this for solids and liquids. If you substitute in these expressions for the partial derivatives into those equation, into this equation up above, and then you integrate and make the assumption that alpha and kappa don't change very much with respect to temperature and volume. And then you can derive this expression, which would be valid for solids and liquids. How does the pressure of the system change with respect to temperature changes and or volume changes? So you can do little calculations with this equation that would be valid for solids and liquids under, under ordinary conditions. Uh, I don't I don't think I'm going to explicitly work this problem. It's really sort of a plug and chug problem, um, and it'll just take up unnecessary time. Anyway, you're given this expression for the difference between the constant pressure and constant volume heat capacity of a system. It's a fairly general expression. It involves alpha, it involves kappa, the molar volume, and temperature. All of these quantities are given to you in the problem, so you really just need to substitute them in and calculate the number. And then what they want you to do is to compare that to an explicit calculation of the difference between the two. And you should find that this formula works pretty good in, um, in determining the difference between the two values. And, and so I'll just leave that as an exercise for you to, to look at on your own. Uh, in this last um, in this last set of slides, we're going to look at another effect uh, where we, we're going to consider enthalpy changes. So previously, we looked at how does internal energy depend on, say, temperature and volume. Uh, for enthalpy, uh, it's it's often convenient to think in terms of temperature and pressure as the independent variables. And so this is another example of the pattern. We have the total differential of enthalpy. So how does enthalpy change when we change temperature and when we change pressure? Notice for the first term, it's the change in enthalpy with respect to a change in temperature, keeping pressure constant, paired up with the temperature differential. And then the second term is for the change with respect to pressure. How does enthalpy change with respect to pressure, keeping temperature fixed now, multiplied by the differential of of pressure. Uh, this quantity right here, the partial derivative of enthalpy with respect to temperature, is the formal definition of the isobaric heat capacity, Cp. 
And then this derivative of enthalpy with respect to pressure can be shown that you can express it as minus the constant pressure heat capacity times another factor, the so-called Joule-Thomson coefficient, this mu jt, uh, where j stands for Joule and t stands for Thomson, the Joule-Thomson coefficient. That has this formal definition. Look, it's a change in temperature with re respect to pressure keeping enthalpy constant. So you have to imagine a process where enthalpy is held constant and you measure how does the temperature change when I change the pressure. So let's suppose that the gas is expanding. That would correspond to a decrease in pressure. Measure the temperature change of your gas, right? So the gas is expanding. It's, it's going from a small volume to a large volume. The pressure is going down, so delta P is negative. Does the gas temperature go up or down? Well, it depends upon the system's conditions. Uh, and it's reflected in what's called the Joule-Thompson coefficient. It can be positive or negative, and when it's not zero, okay, as it is for the case of a perfect gas, because the gas doesn't compare, doesn't care whether it's compressed or not, because the gas molecules don't interact with each other. Uh, for the case where um, the Joule-Thompson coefficient is positive, uh, that means the gas will cool as it expands. And so let's just think about it again here. Okay, the gas is expanding, so the pressure change is negative. If the gas cools, that means the temperature change is negative. And so you would have a negative divided by a negative, which would give you a positive Joule-Thompson coefficient. Uh, this is the case where attractive forces are dominating. Uh, for, for the opposite case where, where the gas warms as it expands, okay, so again, that's a negative number. Um, if, if this is, um, uh, so if this is negative and then delta T is positive, that's going to give you a negative Joule-Thompson coefficient. And, and under these conditions, that means that repulsive interactions are dominating. The Joule-Thompson coefficient changes sign depending on the conditions and so there's a temperature uh, for a given pressure at which the um, at which the the Joule-Thompson coefficient is going to change change sign. Here's a table that, that and that's called the inversion temperature. Here is a t is a table expressing some of the inversion temperatures for several gases as well as the Joule-Thompson coefficient for uh, some of these gases in comparison to the freezing point and boiling point of the gas. Uh, the, yeah, the, the coefficients themselves are evaluated at one atmosphere and, and 298 Kelvin. And there's more values in the resource section if you need them for any of the homework. Uh, here, this is a very simple application, uh, and I like simple applications of the of the Joule-Thompson coefficient. Um, and so here we're looking at the definition of the Joule-Thompson coefficient, and we're given the value for nitrogen at 298 Kelvin in one atmosphere. We're being asked to calculate the change in the temperature as the gas uh, um, when its pressure changes by minus 10 bars. Uh, under isenthalpic conditions. And so you can approximate this as a finite change in temperature with respect to a finite change in pressure and then rearrange it. Delta T will be mu JT times delta P. Substitute in the value 0 0.27 kelvins per bar times minus 10 bars. And so that's going to give us minus 2.7 kelvins for the, uh, for the change in the temperature. So in this case, the temperature is going to drop. So here I think I have a series of figures which I'll do my best to, to explain. Um, 
So here is a device. So 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 what are we what are we talking about next? Well, can, can, it, we're talking about measuring the Joule Thompson coefficient. Uh, so that is when a gas undergoes an expansion or compression under isoenthalpic conditions, we're trying to measure the temperature change associated with that. And it's related to the interactions between the gas molecules. We already talked about Joule's experiment, which failed to show any interactions between gas molecules. Here, in this case, although I'm not going to prove it, but what I'm going to tell you is, is that the Joule-Thompson apparatus is much more precise in detecting um, in detecting the, this effect uh, known as the Joule-Thompson uh, effect. And so here what we have, uh, we have a, a, an inlet with high pressure gas and an outlet for low pressure gas separated by a porous barrier. So this acts as a throttle. It slows down uh, the gas molecules. Uh, you can use this apparatus to measure the change in temperature under different conditions, different, different, different values of the pressure, and then you use the, the thermocouples here to measure the temperature difference. Um, the effect is also important in the um, liquefaction of gases. So here we have something known as a Lindy refrigerator, where we've got circulating gas. So we've got high pressure gas inside this tube here. Here's our compressor. It leads in, okay, and then it spirals down, and here's a throttle. Okay, so it's a porous membrane here that lets the gas pass through from the high pressure region to the low pressure region. And then as it does that, if, if you're below the inversion temperature, what, what, can, what will happen is, is the gas will cool as it goes through the throttle. And then the cold gas cycles back up through the system, further cooling the gas, and then it gets, you know, it goes through heat exchanger and exchanger and is then further is then compressed back to high pressure, and it just keeps circulating through the system. Well, as it circulates, the temperature just of the gas goes down and down and down, and eventually you get to a temperature where you can liquefy, where you can liquefy the gas. And so this would be an example of how, you know, liquid nitrogen is produced. Uh, this is another version of the Joule Thompson uh, experiment. Uh, I'm going to go, it's, it's basically the same thing that we looked at previously, so I'm just going to move on. Um, here, here's a couple of interesting diagrams that I wanted to, to talk about. Um, so what we're looking at is the two different regions here. Right? We've got positive Joule Thompson coefficient and a negative Joule Thompson coefficient. So this corresponds to, this region corresponds to cooling and this corresponds to heating. Uh, this red line here represents the inversion temperature. And then these blue lines, or green lines, I don't know which color they are, they represent isenthalpic expansions. So as you go in this direction along this curve, what you're doing is you're decreasing the pressure. So this is, this is an expansion of the gas. And depending on what your conditions of pressure are, when you expand the gas, it may be the gas may cool or it may heat up. Okay, depending upon both the gas that you're talking about and the nature of its of its intermolecular interactions, as well as the conditions under which you're 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 operating. If you're at low temperatures, you'll see that there'll never be any cooling of the gas here. Or if you're at too high of a temperature, you're not going to have any. Um, cooling of the gas in this range. Here's another diagram. It's the same thing, but with specific um, specific Joule-Thompson coefficients for different gases. So here we see nitrogen, hydrogen, and helium. For the case of nitrogen, if you're, say, at room temperature, right here around 300 at high pressure, and then you expand your gas, so you, let the temp you let the gas expand, its pressure decreases, uh, what you'll find is that the gas will cool when you're near room temperature. So you can produce liquid nitrogen near room you, at when its original temperature is at uh, room temperature. However, for hydrogen, if you've got room temperature hydrogen, which is up here, you're outside of the cooling range. So this is the cooling uh, region. You're in the heating range for nitrogen. If you try to 
uh, take room temperature hydrogen gas and expand it, what you're going to find is that the gas will heat up, which for hydrogen is very, very dangerous because hydrogen is flammable. So if there's any oxygen around as the gas expands and you're heating it up, you're, you're, you're looking at an explosion about to occur. And that's why hydrogen gas cylinders have to have special regulators compared to nitrogen. In any case, uh, well, we've just explored some of the relationships between, um, you know, for state functions in, in various uh, in various examples, and so we'll uh, we'll move on to the next section on adiabatic changes, which should be a fairly short video. Um, we'll save it for the next one.